Defense Matters, a podcast about defense, technology, and the power of that movement. An Israel Defense production in association with IAI. Hello and welcome to Defense Matters, a new podcast that delves into all matters of defense and why they matter. I'm your host, Aaron Heller, and I hope you'll join us on this journey as we look into all the various elements of security, military defense, technology, and everything in between. Each episode, we're going to tackle the uh, relevant issues of the day and discuss the latest in the world of all these things. And we're going to talk also about uh, Game Changer Corner, in which we look at the technologies of the future and how they'll affect the future battlefield. Uh, Before we get started, just a quick note that we're a new podcast. We just got started. So you can follow us in a bunch of different places. We're on YouTube, we're on Spotify, we're on Apple Podcasts. So be sure to click on that subscribe button and follow us wherever you get your podcast. Now, let's dive right into our episode today. And today, obviously, we're going to deal with the most relevant issue right now, and that's the recent wave of terror here in Israel. We've had pretty much uh, the, mo- the bloodiest time here in Israel in several years. Three attacks within a week that killed 11 Israelis. And just this last uh, Thursday, another brazen attack in Tel Aviv killed three Israelis. And there was a manhunt all night long until they finally tracked down the assailant. All of these attacks are very different in their nature, but the one thing that they have in common is that they were carried out by lone gunmen, by lone attackers, who don't seem to have worked with any kind of organizational affiliation, and that brings a whole bunch of other challenges for Israel's defense uh, establishment, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, so I'm really glad that we're joined by someone who knows all about this, Lior Ackerman, a former uh, senior official in uh, the Shin Bet security organization at the rank of Brigadier General. Today, he's an independent commentator. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. So let's get started with that. We're talking about something that happened now um, in the heart of Tel Aviv. This is fresh on all of our minds over here before we had the attacks on Hadera, in Bnei Brak, uh, in Beersheba. Um, let's just start with an overview. Four different attacks, four of them very different. What was the common theme as far as you're concerned? Well, I think it would be a mistake, maybe even a fundamental mistake, to try to find a common ground or a reason for those specific attacks to occur, to happen. There is nothing uh, com- uh, that, uh, common for those attacks. It's, as you said, lone wolves, uh, people that uh, uh, some of them are Israeli Arabs, some of them Palestinians, people that live in a, a, a very negative environment. Some of them are coming from the nationalist uh, point of view, extremist nationalist Palestinians. Some of them are coming from the religious extremist uh, environment. Uh, when it's all combines with the personal or family or um, uh, social uh, frustration, what happens is that such a man is waking up in the morning or the day before, deciding that he wants to do something, obviously to kill someone, obviously to kill a Israeli, because it's much better than to kill anyone else. And he's going out and all this attack is planning in his mind, between his two ears, that's all. So you cannot really know about any planning attack. He's going out, he's killing, using everything he can, either a knife or his car or uh, uh, any weapon he has, and he's doing it. And the problem is that uh, some of the people that looks at him and see the communication and think like him, getting the appetite Mm -hmm. and the inspiration to do the same. That's the problem. So we have a wave of terror, as we call it, but it's not really a wave, it's not organized. There is no terror organization stands behind those people. Everyone is a person that took the decision to do it. Well, that's really interesting that you say that, because probably a, a person from the street will say, oh, it's great, we're not at a war with an organization, it's only individuals, but it's from an organizational perspective, and you were many years in the Shin Bet, that probably makes it even harder, doesn't it? I mean, you have no, how, how do you go after somebody who it's all happening in his head and not... There's no trace, there's no way to follow them intelligence-wise. Well, that's correct. Uh, From the point of view of the intelligence of the ISA, the possibility to collect or to gather intelligence from such people about uh, planning terror attacks is almost impossible. It's almost impossible. 
I think that the country needs to establish some other security circles in order to prevent such attacks. Maybe we will speak about it later, but mm -hmm. the Shin Bet can do whatever he can do. The fact is that just in the last uh, three months from the beginning of the year, the Shin Bet uh, thwarted more than 100 terror attacks that actually planned people, a mission, weapon, and everything else. More than 300 potential terrorists were arrested. So it's almost 100% of the planning attacks are thwarted by the ISA. And still, when it's happened just inside you, between you and yourself, the intelligence cannot know about it. There is no possibility that the ISA will find such a man, if, even if it, it don't have any pass, a security uh, a prison or something like this. So I think that the security circles inside the country much more important in such cases. Well, it's interesting that you say that because, I mean, obviously the nature of the beast in this is we're not going to hear about the successes, unfortunately, in this field of work. You're only going to hear about the times when they actually carry out. So before we get into the details of each one of the attacks, I think a lot of people in Israel ask themselves, why now? I mean, for so long, this is always something that goes along. The Shin Bet is, or the ISA, as you call them, they, they thwart this all the time. Why is it that right now we're seeing all these lone wolves who are coming out of the shadows? Well, as I said, there is no really a common denominator between those people. <clears throat> and I think that the, the question of the timing is also not relevant because we are living here for 70 years and each and every two, three years we have a terror wave, as we call it. It's not something organized. The reality that we are living is a mutual hatred between the people, between the Palestinians and the Israelis, between the Muslim, extremist Muslims and the Jews. It's, it's here and it's going to stay. It, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. And given the incitement that you have in the Palestinian Authority or in the mosques from the extremist chefs, it's all go together and it's here. And we can do something to prevent it but we can't prevent it at all. So the reality is, unfortunately, that we are going to live with attacks and terror for much, a lot, a lot of years, but we can do a lot of things to prevent it. Well, let's break down these to attacks minimize. first, before, before we get into the details of that. There were four attacks. The last two are more the traditional attacks, like you would say, two guys from Jenin, the attack that took place in Bnei Brak, which killed five people, the attack in Tel Aviv that killed three, but the first two, those were actually, the first one was a Bedouin from southern Israel who went to Beersheba, a citizen of Israel, and the one in Hadera was two Israeli Arabs. Now, at the same time as we're seeing this extremism among the, those guys who had some affiliation with ISIS, we're also seeing, you know, a lot of Israeli Arabs who were also among the victims, too. So how do you dance along that line, especially when it comes to Arab citizens of Israel? That makes it even more tricky, doesn't it? We must put uh, the question of the Arab Israeli in a proportion. 99% of the Israeli Arabs are not connected to terror, to security problems, to anything like this, and doesn't support it at all. We do have some cells of people, uh, most of them extremists, uh, Muslims, that does not believe in the, our right to, or of existence here as a, as a Jewish country. Among them, if we are talking about 100,000 people that thinks like that, maybe 10, 15, 20 are ready to execute a terror attack and to do something. So it's, it's a very, very a, a little percentage of the Arab population here. We do have problems in the Arab population, in the crime, in the field of the crime, not in the field of the security. But the Shin Bet know how to collect uh, intelligence even inside Israel. There is a difference, of course, between Palestinians and Arab Israelis because in Judea and Samaria you have the, the military law, and inside Israel it's the Israeli law, so it's different. But the methods and the, the practical work of the Shin Bet inside Israel is the same as it is in the, the, the Palestinian Authority territories. So we can find and we find usually those people who are trying to, to execute terror attacks in Israel. 
And the same, when two or one people inside Israel decide to do such an attack, they do have the weapon, because unfortunately, the Arab sector in Israel has a lot of weapons. And it's not a problem to get from Um al-Fakhir or any other uh, Arab country. Yeah, I was going to get to that, actually, in the next question, about saying how like there's a lot of things that feel like they're mixing up into a salad over here. In the old days, you would say, okay, there's a cell in the West Bank, we'll go in there, we'll invade, we'll go into this refugee camp. But now you've got these weapons in Israel. And I want to ask you, because we're 20 years now after, <clears throat> excuse me, defensive shield in the West Bank, and you hear a lot of people naturally, they, there's these attacks, they say, oh, we need another one of those. But... Is that really the answer, or is there something maybe a little bit different? Maybe maybe the issue of the illegal weapons in Israel is, is the issue that needs to be tackled more seriously now. Those are two different issues. Uh, a large military-scale operation in, uh, in Judea and Samaria can give an answer to some points. I will speak about it later. Me, personally, I don't think that we need today uh, such a, an operation, a military operation, we are doing um, a local uh, operation in Jenin now, but I think that uh, there is no need for such an operation because the intelligence the Shin Bet can gather in Judea and Samaria today is very good. Our ability to thwart any kind of terror that comes from the Palestinian Authority into Israel is working very good. Those systems are working very good. So there is no need for operation to prevent such a terror. You might find justification to such operation because it allows the ISA and the army to make a large scale of arrest, uh, arrest people to find a weapon depot, big uh, weapon depot inside uh, those people's uh, to make a special entry into the uh, Janine refugee camp, which is uh, a ticking bomb, you know. If it's needed, I'm not sure. But maybe the government thinks that it will pass uh, a good uh, vibes to the citizens that wants to yeah. hear, to feel much more security. We don't need it. No, oh, it's interesting that you say that because he is, the Shin Bet is legendary in the way that it can gather information and thwart all these attacks we don't even hear about. And it's gotten so much that people in Israel just assume that they can do everything. And maybe there's something with what's happened the last few weeks that we're just saying, you know what? No matter how good your intelligence is, no matter how good an organization is, there are some things that people just have to realize. There's just they can't do everything. It's not foolproof. I spoke about it a lot in the Israeli media. Because some of the journalists spoke about uh, what happened to yeah. the ISA that didn't prevent uh, those attacks. And the population, the people must understand that we cannot prevent 100% of the attacks. We cannot prevent, from the uh, uh, point of view of the intelligence, we cannot prevent an attack that one people design is his own mind between his two ears. But if we will close... The, the separation fence between us and the Palestinian Authority, but hermetically, not as it goes today. It's impossible. This is the reality of open fence between us and the Palestinian Authority is unacceptable. Every Palestinian wants to enter Israel can do it with or without a weapon. Each and every day, between 50,000 to 80,000 unlicensed Palestinians entering Israel. Mm -hmm. So it's true that 99% of them comes to work, but it's enough that one will bring his own weapon and we can... So many, so many angles to cover and I know there's a lot with more talking. We're a bit running out of time, so let me just leave you with this last question here. We've had these four attacks, they're fresh in our mind. Um, we don't know where this campaign is going. At this point in time, what would you say is the main takeaway so far? What's the main lesson you've learned and the main point we can look ahead at right now? I think that the government must take a few uh, strategic decisions. When the intelligence works very well, the army works very well, the police do whatever it can do, but the government doesn't do enough. Why? First, I said, the separation fence must be closed hermetically and we must allow only people licensed by Israel to come to enter and to work with Israel. This is the first, any, the first step that this government must do. The second is to strengthen the Israeli police. 
we are maybe in the West world or even the entire world, it's the weakest police organization in the world. It needs about 10,000 uh, policemen in the streets. A sit an Israeli citizen must see a policeman in every junction, in every street. That's the only way to prevent such terror attacks or from happening, or if it already happens, to fall it on to thwart it on the place. That's the solution. No miracles. Great. Well, thank you very much, Lior. Fascinating stuff. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And we'll be right back for our Game changer section right after this. Break, break, break. Welcome back. It's time now for our Game Changer Corner in which we discuss the technologies that will affect the future battlefield. And today I'm very happy to be joined by Eyal Shapira, who is the VP and General Manager of Air Defense and Naval Systems Division. Um, welcome to our podcast. Thank you. So I'm glad that you're here because we're going to talk a little bit about radars today and about and specifically about the Iron Dome. Everybody has heard about Iron Dome. It's probably one of the most famous Israeli technologies that's really changed the battlefield here in recent years and around the world. Uh, even recently in the fighting in Ukraine, everybody's saying, oh, well, it would be so different if they had the Iron Dome like in Israel. You can talk to us a little bit about the technology behind it. There's a lot of radars involved in it. Is that true? Yeah, is that true? Uh, first of all, uh, I, I talk about the radar. The radar is part of the Iron Dome system. Uh, actually, it's the heart or the highs of this uh, system. Uh, if we are talking about the process uh, of the intercept in, the, in this system, first of all, we need to detect the, the threats. Uh, actually, a, a huge uh, scale of uh, threats from <laughs> very short to very long uh, rockets, uh, UAV, etc., uh, etc. Et and the radar is the, the one is detected, and then it starts to track. And as a part of the process of the intercept, is help to the BMC, the command and control, and then send it to the rocket, to the interceptor, and help him to uh, in intercept every threat in very, very accurate uh, aspect and very high percentage of uh, success. So the radar is in the main, in the heart of the process of the intercept. Uh, actually, uh, we are very proud of this uh, uh, capability, of this ability to be part of uh, this uh, famous uh, system. Well, like I said, the Iron Dome has really revolutionized the way that Israel defends itself. And at the heart of it, you said there's something called MMR. What exactly is that? What's the heart of the system? MMR is a 15 or 10 years old radar. Uh, actually, the MMR is a multi-mission radar. It's, a, a, as you say, it's very unique radar that uh, changed the, the, the game rules. Uh, from radar that in the uh, past just all search, all track, there you need a two kind of radar. This radar can do both of them, search and track together, and also can make a lot of mission in parallel, which means we can make an artillery mission, air defense mission, uh, to build an air situation picture mission in same radar. This radar can rotate in 360 RP, uh, uh, degree, or to work sectorial as part of Iron Dome and to uh, be as part of a fire control radar as part of a fire uh, system. So it's very unique radar. The multi-mission radar is very good name for understand what is the ability. Uh, and uh, this is the basic of this radar. Great. Now, we know everybody knows this is an Israeli uh, uh, development. It's changed the battlefront, especially uh, across to, with Gaza in recent years. But now it's not just exclusive to Israel. Like, a lot of people want a piece of this, and uh, it's going international in a way. Can you talk a little bit about the trade deals that Israel has been involved in and where Iron Dome is going in the world these days? Yeah, actually, as I say, it's one of our best sellers of AI. Uh, Except from Iron Dome, we are uh, uh, connect and uh, integrate and uh, fully proven, uh, uh, combat proven with the full uh, or few type of uh, uh, rockets or interceptor like Barak and Mix, like Iron Dome, like David Sling, etc. And this helps us a lot to sell this uh, radar to a, a few uh, uh, foreign country uh, all over Europe. 
there is a lot of uh, interest uh, before the this year last two years we are sell this sweater to the uh, german to czech republic that last week we just uh, fully uh, delivered the first, first sweater of this uh, project and we are very proud of the radar uh, all over the uh, world in europe uh, and uh, other uh, and uh, 10, uh, 10 other Fluidian country. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that insight, Eyal, and thanks for joining us. And that does it for this episode of Defense Matters. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Please follow us wherever you get your podcasts, and we hope to see you here again. Until then, I'm your host, Aaron Heller, saying goodbye, and we'll see you next time on Defense Matters. <laughs>